Welcome to Better Health Guy Blogcasts, empowering your better health. And now, here's Scott, your Better Health Guy. The content of this show is for informational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose, treat, or cure any illness or medical condition. Nothing in today's discussion is meant to serve as medical advice or as information to facilitate self-treatment. As always, please discuss any potential health-related decisions with your own personal medical authority. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode number 81 of the Better Health Guy blogcast series. Today's guest is May Dooley, and the topic of the show is Create Your Healthy Home. May Dooley is a former middle school science teacher who loves to educate and empower people with information to improve their environment and thus their lives. She's been an environmental consultant for more than 24 years, helping people make their home environment healthier. She leads her clients through the basic steps to assess and create a healthy home, which includes air quality, water quality, and reduced exposure to other stressors that may impact health, such as electromagnetic fields. Her inspections are interactive, and her clients learn how to measure EMFs, reduce body voltage in their bed, use a laser particle counter to evaluate their vacuum cleaner, and to take samples to explore for mold. She even brings along her microscope and looks at the samples in your home. Once she's evaluated an environment using the principles of bowel biology, she provides an easy-to-understand series of steps to improve the environment. And now, my interview with May Dooley. I first heard about May Dooley from one of my favorite doctors, Dr. Ann Corson, and I later had the opportunity to meet May at the Delmarva Lyme Conference in Baltimore earlier this year, and I knew after talking with her that we just had to do a show on this very important topic of optimizing the environment in order to optimize our health. So I'm very excited today to have May Dooley on the show. Thanks so much for being here, May. My pleasure. Thanks. So what drew you from the world of being a science teacher to evaluating people's homes and exploring ways to improve the environment in support of their health? Did you have some type of personal health experience that led you down this path? I I would, yes and no. I I did have formaldehyde sensitivities, which caused me to get interested in the subject of uh, mold uh, or the environment. Actually, my sensitivities were underlined by mercury fillings. So when I got my fillings out, the migraine stopped within a year or two and haven't come back. Uh, So, but I had had a a home inspection franchise before this. Uh, I did that for about 10 years and then started the um, the environmental. I went to one of the health fairs in Manhattan and there was uh, one of the building biologists who was giving a session on uh, safe baby bedrooms. And it was fascinating. I originally thought I could combine it with my home inspection, the pre-purchase, but it was not a good match. So um, I sold the pre-purchase uh, franchise and started this in 1994. And it was late 90s. So my accountant just said, I think you better look for a job uh, when mold hit the news. <laughs> wow. And I've been busy ever since. So you approach the environment from a different perspective, from a bow biology perspective, which is a little different than how other environmental professionals might approach things. So what is bow biology and how does that system impact the work that you do with your clients today? This is out of a German institute, the Institute for Bau Biology. Bau in German is building. So now it's, now it's better known in this country as building biology. They basically look at anything in a house that could adversely impact on health. And they use the, the safe number as zero. So we try to get as close to zero as we can across the board with pollutants, not only with air, water, electromagnetic fields, uh, and mold, but um, in, uh, other types of pollutants such as noise pollution and not enough light and so on. Mm-hmm. Wow. So it's a very comprehensive way of looking at the environment. You mentioned mold. So in terms of things that people can do on their own as maybe an initial screening before they bring someone like yourself in or another expert, are there some tests that you think are a reasonable first step in evaluating an environment? Yes. And the first step is to engage one's brain 
put one Sherlock, Sherlock Holmes hat on and uh, try to think in terms of hypotheses. Hypotheses are an educated guess where mold might be. Uh, mold would typically be around water, so it may be around plumbing, um, pa possibly past leaks. It may be in a damp basement. It may be on some furniture of unknown origin, antiques and so on, or it may be uh, for a, a damp house, maybe a house that's overshaded by trees or downhill from where rainwater would flow. So once you have your hypothesis, then you can get a good flashlight and go do a visual test. You may see some signs of mold, um, particularly a black mold, which is tip, which unless it's a, a neglected or a forgotten leak area, probably isn't Stachybotrys, the so-called toxic black mold. Uh, it's more likely to be Cladosporium, which likes areas of condensation, uh, such as window sills, refrigerator gaskets, and so on. So you would do a visual inspection, uh, particularly down in basements by the bottoms of walls, um, and uh, and. Uh, also, check for basement ceiling joists and subflooring. One way to check up there, and this may be a black mold, it may be kind of a light greenish or whitish mold. If you hold your flashlight parallel to the surface, it's easier to see if there's fuzz on the surface. Another thing you can do is take clear scotch tape and touch, hold it by the, like a three inch piece, hold it by the two ends, touch the middle to a surface that you suspect might be mold. And if it comes off as a film, it probably is mold. If it's crumbly or you don't see anything that comes off, it, it may not be mold. Um, so that's a couple of the things that can be done. Another thing is the sniff test. If you smell mold, it's probably mold that is growing and giving off gases. Uh, if there's a suspicion of mold in a wall cavity, you may smell a musty smell at the outlet. Uh, so that's uh, another possible um, approach there. Excellent. We, we have heard some people suggest that air sample testing is not a good approach for testing mold. So tell us about culture plate sampling compared to spore trap testing and why culture plates might be a better option. Is there uh, some way that people can do this type of testing as a screening test on their own at home as well? Uh, I a uh, culture plate, first to, to define it, is where you're taking a given volume of air and putting the petri on, onto a Petri dish. It's impacting onto a Petri dish, and then the Petri dish typically goes into an incubator for a week. Uh, the mold, if, if there are mold spores, which are the reproductive bodies of mold, if they are in the air, they'll impact on the dish, and then they'll start to grow. They go through a little grid so you can quantify from room to room. The re and with spore trap test, you're basically counting spores. And since spores of several species uh, or several gene genera um, uh, are spherical, they lump all the spherical spores together. And that would be penicillium, aspergillus, trichoderma, and some other round spores. Um, you you can't track sources as well. You can't track um, the spread of mold, the cross-contamination of mold uh, with spore trap as well as you can with culture plate. With culture plate, you have the ability to see where the mold is as well as what kind of mold is there. Now, in terms of other comparisons with them, spore trap t testing can be faster. It can be a turnaround of even a day or two as soon as it gets to the lab. The numbers in spore trap tests are higher because they're counting the dead spores as well as the live spores. Uh, the uh, culture plate of, um, and converse would be um, longer, takes longer to get them, and the numbers are going to be lower. I never depend solely on the air tests because... Uh, they they may confirm that there is a mold issue, but they don't tell you where it is. 
And unless you know where it is, how do you know how to clean it up properly? So I always like to combine it with microscope work to confirm where the growth is, and then we can take further steps to clean it up. <laughs> and, and isn't it true that some of the air sample testing that some of the molds like Stachybotrys are heavier and aren't necessarily floating around in the air that they tend to go to the surfaces? Is that true? Yes, Stachybotrys spores can also tend to be sticky, so they don't become airborne that easily. There are different reasons. There are several variables why spores might be released into the air. One is dryness, and, and of course, people often put dehumidifiers up to dry out uh, a, an area that might have mold, but the mold, so to speak, thinks it's dying, so it releases spores at, um, as a function of just the dryness of the air. Um, I have seen um, one room where the mold was black on the walls from condensation. It was all cladosporium. I did an air test and it looked fine because the mold was not releasing spores to the air. So it's not, I find air tests very useful, but not uh, the final word all the time. So from your perspective, what are the pros and the cons of the ERMI, which is what many people are using? Um, what are the things that the ERMI score can mean? And can you have a high score, but a safe environment or a low score and an unhealthy environment? Sure. Uh, ERMI tests, uh, as, as probably many people know, has some controversy about it. Um, the EPA does have a disclaimer on their website saying that it was not uh, certified for residential use, uh, not supported for residential use. It can be useful, but the score can be misleading. Uh, Dr. Joseph Spurgeon has a, a short paper out where he has used the same data to show that the ERMI score uh, either was kind of on target or it missed mold uh, or it um, overestimated the amount of mold. In other words, um, the score can make a good house sound bad and a bad, bad house sound good. So it shouldn't be the final uh, or the only tool to be used. ERMI, ERMI testing. Uh, is um, very sensitive testing. It's D on a DNA level. If one spore gets dried out and breaks up into 25 different little pieces, it's counted as 25 in the army. So some people look at the scores and are quite horrified when it's not necessarily that high uh, in the house. Um, I, I have found that type of testing, qPCR, uh, um, I, I don't use the ERMI test personally. I use qPCR, which would be the same type of technology, a quantitative mold-specific polymerase chain reaction. That's the long word for it. Um, it is useful for the species. And I do testing with the species, particularly on air, sea, air conditioning um, supply vents and returns. Um, but I've had too many cases where People have reported um, wide variations in report in results, and what does that mean? Uh, just to give two examples, one of my clients was hunting for a healthier home, and he told me after the fact that he had done 25 ERMI tests, and the only one that passed was brand new construction. So they moved there, and what does that that what that told me? is that just about any house is going to have some unfavorable numbers. So why spend the money on confirming that? Why not keep it simple, look for the sources of the mold and see how it can safely be cleaned up? Uh, another woman, when I went to her home, she told me she had done four army tests on two rooms, the master bedroom and the uh, family room. And she got four different results. There had been no remediation done in the interim. And the results uh, ranged from acceptable to unacceptable with points in between. So it's like, will the real score stand forth? And, <laughs> and the, she told me the last two scores were done uh, on, in the master bedroom, one on one side of the bed, and two weeks later, the other on the other side of the bed with no cleaning in between. One score was passing and one score was failing. So with that, um, I, to me, I, I'm, I'm a 
a simple person with one foot in the 18th century. Let's find out where the mold is. Let's see how it can safely be cleaned up. Let's check your vacuum cleaner. Make sure that's not recycling junk back into room air. Let's have good housekeeping. Let's not have a lot of clutter, a streamlined house, and that is easy to clean and maintain it uh, and, and get on top of any leaks that happen. Don't wait for mold to develop. Take the the wet drywall out, and it's a drywall issue at that point, not a mold remediation issue. Take uh, precautions for areas where mold could grow, like if you have a basement. Um, to me, a good step of prevention is just to have the uh, a sealant put on all the unpainted wood in the basement, so you've removed that that source of mold. Uh, growth and um, and be careful with storage down there. Don't feed lunch to mold by bringing vulnerable materials into a below grade space. One of the labs that I had not heard of prior to getting ready for our talk today was Assured Bio, and you've talked about their Cap Ermi. So, how is the Cap Ermi different? How is it potentially better? And tell us a little bit about how that might fit into exploring mold in the work that you do with your clients. Okay, uh, this this um, Assured Bio Labs does the same type of ERMI testing, but they also offer other options. They or- offer something called CAP testing, which just stands for Cladosporium aspergillus or, or Oreobacidium, perhaps, and uh, P, P penicillium. Uh, and then they offer different options. You could get CAP2, which is just two species. You could get CAP4, CAP8, CAP14, or the full range of the CAP36. Uh, um, the CAP tests allow you to do the same type of tests without a score that can be misleading, but not for so much money. For example, the CAP14, which typically covers 14 of the major Uh, species that would be found in water damage that might be more related to health. The cap 14 is $135. So it's, it's more, uh, more affordable for, for many people. Yeah. And, and, And how is the technology different in that? Does it also have the potential to have a high score that might actually not be a problem or a low score that might actually be a problem? Is that still the same as the ERMI or is there a difference? There's a difference because there is no score with the CAP testing. All they do is give you the numbers for each species, which are also present, identical in the Army score, uh, the Army uh, test rather, not the score. The only thing that's different is you can have fewer species tested for. If you were just interested, like in Stachybotrys, maybe you could go with the CAP-8 for $105 instead of the CAP, uh, instead of getting the whole Army for $299. And with Hurts Me, you get five species for whatever they're charging now, 150 or so. Um, with the CAP 14, you get 14 species for 135. Mycotoxin testing is available mainly, I guess, through real-time labs. And there are some doctors um, who uh, refer to me and have basically said, we don't know if mycotoxins cause the illness or not, but um, as the numbers get lower, our people seem to get help, be feeling better. So, And I'm not in a position to make any uh, judgments on mycotoxins either. I'm not a lab. I'm not um, a researcher and, and so on. I'm just a, a simple mold inspector who is trying to not miss mold if something is going to affect people. So rather than do testing, I'm back pretty much to square one. Find the mold, safely get rid of it, find out how much cross-contamination there was, clean it up properly. Uh, and that's that's my responsibility here is what is cleaning it up properly? Even if we don't test, let's say, let's suppose that mycotoxins were present. The, it seems to me that the remediation protocol should be um, general enough to address all concerns. The basic cleanup, removal of contaminated material, cleaning up of spores and so on, the negative pressure, the, the uh, containment, all of that. But then also for the, the folk that are um, 
quite convinced that mycotoxins play an issue. What can we add into the regular protocol to get rid of mycotoxins? And for the folk that are convinced that um, suspended microparticles uh, remain after conventional mold remediation, what can we put into the protocol to get rid of that? Well, that seems like a, a simple approach, but it's not so easy to get the answers for those because we don't have research to confirm um, that the methods that are being talked about really are doing, are delivering what they're saying they're doing. Um, I don't know of any testing uh, other than their... Um, I believe there's something called EM3 or EM3 that uh, folk are saying are are helping to clean up mycotoxins. Um, some of my clients have said good. Some have said it's it's not um, didn't do too much uh, as, as far as they could tell. It's very um, it, it's it's hard to get answers in this area. One. Uh, my colleagist uh, said to me, he said, well, you could clean it with anything and get them off the surfaces. So we we do have that wipe down, whether it's a, a dilute uh, isopropyl alcohol or, or, or a hydrogen peroxide or Benefect or um, any of those uh, as a wipe down. And then for the microparticles, that also is controversial. There is a feeling that misting, which is the more accurate term to fogging, that misting uh, at the end of the remediation process will uh, have the microparticles attracted to the mist droplets, and then they'll be pulled down because of gravity, and whence they will be wiped up. Uh, that's fine, but someone from the EPA has uh, told me, said, well, you know the science, the physics doesn't support that. If you fi they figure a mist droplet is like the Earth, and another one is the Moon with lots of microparticles in between. Obviously, the mist droplets are not going to get all the microparticles. Uh, I cannot uh, comment on that. Again, I'm I'm not in a research position, but we because uh, there are a body of physicians who deal with mold who feel that misting is helpful. It's in my protocol, you know, and we do it. It's not It's not a big additional step. It's just the final misting, and they're going to do a wipe down anyway. So, But it sounds, um, it sounds like one of the differences is if you're doing misting or fogging the way you're doing it, you're still identifying the source of the problem, getting that out of the picture, and then doing this as an additional step versus what I've heard some people doing is the misting or fogging as the solution to the problem when, when there's a significant mold issue. Is that, am I understanding? correctly? Oh, correct. Yes. Okay. You have to remove the source. I've had um, a few instances where where clients have wanted to try uh, a method of uh, avoiding an expensive remediation job. One man had bought for uh, some, some type of ionization machines that were presented as dealing with mold and cleaning up the air and so on and so forth. So he bought uh, he put two of these in the basement at right by the sites of where we knew mold was growing. He ran them for four months, and then he sent me tape samples to look at under the microscope, and there was still plenty of mold on the surfaces. So it hadn't killed the mold or disintegrated the mold on the surfaces. In fact, he, he tried to get his money back, and he was told that the guarantee just just meant didn't state it, but it just meant that uh, they would only guarantee that a 30% reduction in levels, air levels of mold. So he, I think he gave up on that. But um, I haven't seen anything of a fogging nature that gets rid of mold on the surface. With one exception, um, I did um, uh, have one experience where chlorine dioxide was used, but the woman uh, turned off the unit that was producing this um, in the middle of the night. She didn't feel good from it, and it's not uh, its not what we recommend for trying. But when I went back to the house the next day to check in um, the workroom in the basement where the mold was, the mold was gone. You know, so wow. that was, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> I guess if you're going to bring the big guns out that could be problematical for health, you know, then maybe this is an easier step, but we don't so, recommend that. 
So we talked a little bit about the debate around the mycotoxin discussion. Um, you've said that the microbial VOCs or volatile organic compounds are likely even a bigger issue. So tell us a little about these microbial VOCs. What's the impact of them? How can we test for them? And then what do we do about them? Okay. Microbial VOCs are gases that come from mold growth. You may or may not smell these gases. I had spoken with someone at um, U, what is now UL Environmental Labs down in Marietta, Georgia, and they were giving me a little of the history of it. They said some creative uh, research was going on in the early 90s um, on this uh, when insurance companies were still paying for lab testing. And once there was a drawback on the part of insurance companies, the testing was just too expensive for them to continue. So they, they, that research just stopped. I don't know um, whether it's more significant or less significant, but I believe that it's one of the four things that uh, people can react to. And I, I know some of my largest exposures have been with gases. Uh, I usually sail through an inspection pretty well, but uh, every once in a while, there's one where, where, which does have heavy gases and, and it can uh, make me feel a little um, uh, wheezy or such for a couple of hours. Um, and I've had heard this from other people too, that they uh, apparently seem to have neurological effects from the gases when they um, breathe them in. The the key to getting rid of the gases is the same as we were talking about before. Keep it simple. Find the sources of the growth because you have to eliminate the sources or you'll never eliminate the gases. Get rid of the sources and, and continue with the proper remediation and such. Some things can absorb gases and it's not mold growth. For example, if you had a moldy basement and you, you put some clothing in a... Um, a, a plastic bag and put it down in the basement. The clothing doesn't get moldy, but it absorbs the musty smells of the basement. And that may be able to be washed out, maybe not. Um, I had uh, some books that I hadn't realized were down in the basement of my previous home. And they, they don't have mold on them. They were in boxes, but they smell musty. So I'm going to just try some ozonation on them and see if they're salvageable from that direction. But they may not be. Yeah. You, on your website, you mentioned that there's eight common fungi. You mentioned Alternaria, Aspergillus, Cotomium, Cladosporium, Penicillium, Stachybotrys, Trichoderma, and Eulocladium. Is there any one of these that you think is more concerning from a health perspective? Um, which ones, when you find them, do you say, uh-oh, this is a significant issue? Well, we, we're looking for zero tolerance because there's so much that's not known about mold. Maybe somebody is reacting to a mold that just hasn't been studied yet. So we want to get rid of all, all mold growth in a house as to the extent that is practical. Um, the aspergillus has not really gotten the media attention that I think it deserves because aspergillus can be lethal. It can grow in human tissue, and it is so common in houses. Uh, the, uh, the, the species of aspergillus that's been mostly associated with fungal infections in the body is um, typically fumigatus, which likes a, a higher degree of heat than the most of the rest of the aspergillus. I, got, I was uh, home one Saturday night, and I got a phone call from um, a, a man that had worked as an energy raider. And as part of his work, he had to climb on ladders up to close vents, open vents, take measurements at vents, and so on. He told me that nobody ever told them in training that they should be wearing respirators. And he started with headaches. He had an MRI or whatever was done. They found aspergillus growing in his brain. He was operated on. They, he was left with epilepsy. Then it migrated to his lungs. And he was on one, two, three, or four medications. And they stopped working. And finally, had, they was, he was on a fifth one that was much stronger. But this is the type of thing that, uh, I mean, he was, he was an able-bodied man. You wouldn't expect that he would have a problem of this sort. So um, 
this is why I say to people, you know, we don't fool around with mold. Wear proper respiratory protection if you're goggles if necessary and whatever um, uh, special equipment you might need. So asp- and aspergillus is also a concern because it's almost uh, amongst the most common, that and penicillium. Uh, it's just about in every basement I inspect somewhere. Uh, and and um, it, the homeowner is not the one that is going to typically be at the uh, greatest risk for infection. It's the person that starts uh, tearing walls down and um, tossing furniture or moldy items around in a basement. Uh, that's why you want the lung protection with that. Now, that said, I have had instances where I found aspergillus growth for ye- that apparently had gone on for years in an apartment, and the woman had the reactions to the recent water event, which was stachybotrys. She wasn't reacting to the aspergillus. She reacted to the stachybotrys, and the stachybotrys um, uh, affects some people quite a lot neurologically. Uh, that, of course, is the mold that started the mold industry off when um, uh, when uh, a gentleman who was in the financial industry uh, noticed that he was losing his ability to multitask, his memory was going, he eventually lost his job over it, and it was traced, uh, one hypothesis is that the issue was traced back to exposure to stachybotrys. And research shows that damage neurologically may or may not be permanent. There's research on both sides of the fence, but um, I have had clients that could walk around a room and point to a wall and say that I feel dizzy here and the stachybotrys behind the wall. Uh, So whatever is coming through that wall um, does seem to affect some people quite severely. I don't often find um, a, a client in a home where they can't have things made right for them, but if there's going to be some instance of where they have to uh, leave the home behind, it's it's more often, I think, with stachybotrys than with the other types of mold. Yeah. One of the unique things that you do is look at samples with your microscope right on site with the client. So tell us a little bit about your microscope and how that fits into the evaluation that you do for mold in a home. And then what can you see with the microscope? Sure. Uh, I started with the microscope probably on my first inspection, although I left the microscope at home. So I did some tape samples, brought them back to the office, looked at them. Um, Fine, got my answers. Second inspection comes up, same thing. They do the tape samples at the house, bring them back to the office to look at under the microscope. And the thought occurs to me, Wow, if I were back at that, if I was still at that house, I would like to get some more samples in this area, you know. And that's the last time I left my microscope home. Now I brought it to the house afterwards because it is so handy. Um, and and if needed, you can go back and check more samples. I've gradually, as I've learned from houses and from clients, I've increased the number of places where I sample. Uh, I, I know from experience where mold grows, um, it likes to grow under basement steps, on basement joists and subflooring and sink cabinets and so on. But I can also um, now find other areas such as I'm doing a furniture composite room by room that is touching one tape to the vulnerable areas of furniture under the unfinished surfaces, which are hard, easier for mold to grow on than shiny surfaces would be, under beds, bed slats versus whatever soft material is under there. I've found several bed slats that are full of aspergillus and penicillium for some reason. Um, antiques can have mold growth on them. So you never know where you're going to find mold. And uh, it it really has been my main tool on on site. Um, Yeah. What are some of the common causes of mold becoming an issue in a home? Is it always from water damage, from a leak in the roof? Or what what are some of the more common reasons we might have mold in a home? Yeah, it's going to be moisture somewhere. So it could be a leak, it could be a roof leak, a flashing leak, it could be a damp basement. A lot of people think that 
because they don't see water in their basements, it's safe to finish the basement. But they're missing one important fact, and that is that foundations are not typically waterproof. They can be made waterproof, but it's rare that they are at the time of construction. So if we have porous concrete that is allowing moisture through, even it might not be, just might be vapor coming through, and you've put up drywall, which has a paper backing, and mold's job in nature is to break down cellulose, uh, you uh, run the risk of having mold growth on those um, Behind, in the wall cavities in a basement, that may, might not show up in room air sampling because the spores aren't going to get through the walls into the room air, but you uh, run the issue of the mold gases, the MVOCs, which can affect our health. Yeah. Okay, very interesting. Um, you mentioned that when you're working with clients that it's uncommon for them to have to move, that generally with remediation steps, they generally can improve the environment. If someone gets to the point that they do have to move to a new environment, what's the minimum testing that you would recommend doing before they commit to a new living space? Uh, okay. They, in, an, in a prospective home, they would want to look at the sink cabinets and see if there's signs of water damage or water staining. Uh, the risk is that water would have gotten below the base of the sink, so that might be a remediation job, or it might be a surface thing too, if a spill from a bottle of some sort. Uh, the basement is a big one because it's um, it's such it can be such a large area. The ceiling joists, the subflooring, check those areas. Now, a conventional mold inspection is basically a visual inspection and plus a couple of spore trap samples in the house. Problem is that a lot of mold, maybe most of the mold is not visible to the naked eye. So you could have high levels on the ceiling joists and subflooring in the basement and you can't see it. It looks perfectly clean. Uh, and it may not show up in air tests. It may not show up in the spore trap tests. I, I had um, one house. It was a two-year-old house. The man was in a spacesuit before he could go in. He said, I'm terribly reactive in this house. I know there's mold here. I had uh, hired the best company I could find, they spent thousands of dollars on lab tests. They found nothing. And when I came in with my microscope and took four months to go in because, uh, you know, from his perspective, he had already had the best and nothing was found. But he finally bit the bullet and said, well, come on in. And, um, and, and I found the whole basement ceiling covered with aspergillus. It just was not releasing spores. It didn't show up in the, air, the previous company's air tests. So that was one big ticket item. Another big ticket item was he had uh, storage shelves that were pressed wood and some storage shelves like that are, are okay, but these were not okay. These were covered with aspergillus. And then a th third and fourth area, his, um, there were potted plants on the floor that had been overwatered, and stachybotrys was growing into the wood flooring under that. And it, we did, I think, 110 samples, tape samples at that house. And we were sitting out at his picnic table because he couldn't be in the house and he wanted to see what I was finding. At the end of the inspection, he shook my hand. He said, I felt I got my money's worth today. And that's what you can do with a microscope. You know, it's why I can't understand how, how other inspectors can even, not that they're not, there aren't good ones and professional ones, but um, you, it's hard for me to take the little bit of data that's there from a few air samples and a visual inspection and to be able to interpret what's going on at that house or to be able to feel confident that I found as many sources of mold growth as are uh, physically humanly possible to find you know right now I'm um, we're I'm um, we're broadcasting, I'm at a client's home and there's um, remediation going on in the rest of the house. There, there were some um, anomalies felt, found in the construction of the house. So I am, the remediator is uh, feeding me tape samples. I'm looking at to the microscope and we are just tracking how far uh, remediation needs to extend and where the mold is growing. So awesome. it's, it's a nice collaboration. 
when you have a client that needs to move to a new environment from one that had a known mold issue, what belongings are safe for them to take? What belongings should they leave behind? And are there some that maybe they can bring but need to go through some type of cleaning process? Okay. Uh, when we're talking about moving from a moldy home, I'm going to assume that there were spores and other mold particulates in the air and it wasn't all hidden mold. Um, and if, if we assume that there are mold particulates in the air, we have to assume that those particulates are over everything. So some things can be washed. Um, the th items that are metal, glass, um, plastic can all be washed in a dishwasher or soapy water, whatever. Uh, hard wood items that are just plain wood probably can just be wiped down um, with uh, Benefect or um, uh, hydrogen peroxide, something like that. Porous items probably have to be discarded, not probably, would have to be discarded. Upholstered items, uh, mattresses, rugs and carpets, all of those things. Now that said, um, I have had people that even with the most careful wiping down of, let's say, a wood table that has no porous air uh, items, uh, no porous uh, surfaces, uh, they still react. So it is somewhat of an individual thing. Some people are fine by doing a basic cleanup and others not so much. Uh, books, books are problematical. Um, I learned a lesson from a recent move that I made because I had a ton of books. And just in moving those, even though they had been um, the, the house had been maintained, there was still so much dust release that I had uh, enough respiratory distress that I said, they're not coming into my new house. So anything in my new house is uh, vacuumed off and going uh, behind glass walls in a, um, in a bookcase. So I'm not s sitting them out because once books are dusty, you, it's hard to get the dust off. You can use a HEPA vacuum, but um, they're better off behind um, glass bookcases. And, and if there were some books that uh, someone wanted to keep, but they had, had been in a moldy house, then uh, I would say vacuum them and put them in plastic bags or plastic bins and read them out under a tree. You know, don't, don't uh, open them up into the new house. What do you recommend for clothing? Can clothing be washed? Can it be dry cleaned? Or do we need to dispose of all of our clothing? Yeah. The feedback I've gotten is that, um, well, general rule, if there's mold growth on clothing, you know, then get rid of it. But if it's just a matter of VOCs, perhaps you can just wash them. Some clothing um, hangs on to volatile uh, smells this, and, and might, might have to be discarded. Others, it can wash out. Um, I have had some feedback from a physician uh, who do does a lot of testing, that uh, he didn't feel that uh, dry cleaning would be sufficient for getting rid of uh, mold particulates from clothing. Um, I haven't had... Any, anybody that has been that sensitive has pretty much gotten rid of anything that needed to be dry cleaned, in my experience. Mm. So washing with vinegar or borax may not be enough to address it if it actually has mold in it, is what I'm hearing. Right. There's a lot of people that test for mold in outside air and then compare that to inside air and then draw conclusions that the home is fine or not. What's the significance of testing outside air? Is that really relevant in the work that you're doing? Uh, the main reason I test outside air is so that whoever's reading the report, uh, an insurance company, uh, an attorney, or someone of that sort, uh, would not question my abilities if I don't do an outside sample because they might believe that that's necessary. So I don't want to hurt the credibility of my report, which would hurt my client. And that's why I would do an outside sample. But unless you know the species of the inside and outside molds, it's really not relevant. Um, let's say that you had, oh, 100, uh, 100 aspergillus spores in the outside air and um, 50 in inside air. 
are you going to say that's fine, that house is fine because it's lower than the outside? Well, what if they were different species? What if outside was Aspergillus versicola and inside is Aspergillus terrius? Obviously, you have an inside source for Aspergillus terrius. So it shows that the numbers really don't matter unless you know the species and spore trap testing is not going to tell you the species. Are we generally better to have windows open or closed? I used to hear that open was best, but then I know so many people now have air filtration systems to try to minimize uh, internal sources of toxic exposures. And in that case, maybe then opening the windows isn't a great idea. So where do you fall on that open versus closed for the windows? Yeah, part of it, it depends on the quality of the outside air. If you're on a busy street, obviously, you don't want to bring traffic fumes in. Um, I I am not an air conditioning person. I don't use, I just use an overhead fan. So I, my windows are always open, but I live in an area where the air is pretty good. Uh, and some people can't do that just because of pollen allergies. So let's, let's say that's a nice way to go if you have good air and you, you're good with outside air. Uh, if you have to have a controlled indoor environment with the windows closed, then an important consideration that's often not thought of is uh, fresh air. It's air exchange. A lot of people feel better just with ventilation in the house, and they don't, they're not even aware of ventilation as a possibility. It's not enough just to open doors and, and get enough oxygen in um, and out. I had uh, interesting feedback from a client a week or two ago. She, I had recommended a ve ventilation specialist to come into the home and, and um, make recommendations for what would be the best options for this particular house. And he had a carbon dioxide meter. Uh, this was a fairly large house, not one that you would think would have an issue with carbon dioxide. And she, she reported that the carbon dioxide was elevated. So that kind of uh, confirmed that just about any house needs uh, some attention to ventilation and people can feel a lot better with fresh air coming in. When someone sees visible mold, let's say in a bathroom or on a surface, are there some cleaners that you think are the best ones to use? I know you mentioned Benefect, which I think is also Benefect mm -hmm. Decon 30. Um, I've heard some people talk about Concrobium. What cleaners do you think are okay for people to try to use on their own when there is a visible mold issue? Uh, the cleaner, the, there is a variety of them. Whatever uh, they are comfortable with, they might want to use a mild detergent or hydrogen peroxide, Benefect, um, anything that doesn't have a pesticide in it. Um, you, you don't really need an antimicrobial. You're just cleaning off a surface uh, of dust. Uh, it, it doesn't even have to be, uh, you know, think of it as mold, just clean it off. Now, if it is another surface, such as um, a stud or the ceiling joists in the basement, where you have mold there, um, uh, and maybe the homeowner isn't the person to do this, or at least should take precautions with the goggles and the, and the respirator and so on. Um, but there, they might use just borax on a damp cloth and uh, wipe it off a damp sponge. You don't want to overwet it, but the abrasive action of borax um, has has worked quite well in, in many cases. Uh, in fact, somebody from the EPA's Indoor Air Quality Lab uh, told me they had run a test in there between a mild bleach, uh, hydrogen peroxide, and borax, and they found borax was by far better than the other the other two were getting well, and, and, and I've heard that with bleach that it can make it look like the issue is gone because it actually will lighten the color of the mold but maybe it's not actually doing a whole lot is that is that true that it's really just making it look better but may not actually have solved the problem uh, if you're using straight bleach it it typically would get rid of whatever mold is there, but it's a lot worse for your health than the mold is. So yeah. we don't recommend bleach at all. Um, another factor with bleach is that it can react with organic matter and give off carcinogenic chemicals. So you're, you're really um, getting more than you bargained for with bleach. And, and the smell can soak into the wood. That's bothersome to, to many people. 
Yeah. You talked about misting or fogging. What are your thoughts on other things like using ozone or diffusing essential oils? I've heard arguments on both sides that these can be good. And I've heard some people suggest that they can be bad. So ozone and essential oils, what are your thoughts? Okay. Uh, research was done by Berkeley Analytical Labs probably 20 years ago or more on the use of ozone uh, in treating uh, cigarette smoke, or I, yeah, I believe it was tobacco smoke, as being representative of several broad categories of pollutants. And what they found uh, and, and uh, published was that the ozone did not just turn into harmless uh, water and hydrogen, but instead it produced, it reacted with some of these compounds and made worse compounds. Um, and we we know that ozone can react in homes with things like um, the rubber gaskets around a refrigerator door and um, foam pillows, foam cushions of furniture. So it's who knows what it's forming. Um, it from what my understanding is uh, from conference hearing it at conferences that it doesn't kill mold uh, on higher concentrations that can uh, kill bacteria, but that those are higher than the EPA allows um, for residential use anyway. Um, so we don't recommend ozone. And the uh, EPA has a um, brochure out on air cleaners and uh, ozonation versus the old-fashioned ones with the HEPA filter, which tested much better. Uh, they had one italicized sentence in the whole brochure, and it was ozone is harmful to lung tissue. So we don't we don't recommend that. Uh, I again, I'm not a researcher. I just work with my equipment and see what I learn. So I found this one house where there was quite a bit of mold, and I made my recommendations. And the woman said, "Ah, I'm going to just use uh, essential oils." Thieves. She had just apparently read a book or something on it. So she used Thieves, uh, and she called me the next year, and she said, uh, I want you to come and test my house again. So not knowing whether it would work, what her actions would work or not, I went back, and there was the same mold was there. So um, uh, it, it didn't appear to have worked, and uh, she called me a year later and wanted me to come back again. I said, really, I don't want to take your money, you know. No, I can't do this. She said, oh no, no, no! I really, you know, I've up the up the essential oils or whatever she did. I'm sure it works this time. And the same mold was there. So. Wow, my understanding is that some vacuum cleaners can stir things up and spit toxins back out into the air. Is there a particular vacuum cleaner that you recommend? My favorite vacuum cleaner of, of all time was discontinued. And uh, yes, I, I protested bitterly, but it got me nowhere. That was with the Nilfist company, uh, and, and for Nathan, I-L-F-I-S-K. They do have a, an excellent vacuum cleaner. It's the GM80, George Michael 80. Uh, it has, it, or you can get it with an Ulpa filter which is better than a HEPA filter. It's down to 0.1 microns instead of 0.3. Uh, that's the vacuum cleaner I have, and it's excellent. Not everybody can uh, go for fourteen or $1,500 for a vacuum cleaner. And I was fortunate I bought it in a closeout on eBay, so you could keep your eye open on that, but never buy a used vacuum cleaner, uh, even with Nilfus, because you don't know whether it's been used in mold remediation and doesn't have uh, much life left in it or it's full of lead dust or who knows what. Um, so I like that. The Nilfisk does have um, lower end vacuums for about $400. Other vacuum cleaners that are good are the Mealy, typically. Uh, that one, M I E L E. That one, you would want to make sure that you have a HEPA vacuum and a HEPA filter because sometimes people think they're buying a HEPA filter and it does not come with one. And the numbers are not so good when test tested with a laser particle counter. Uh, uh, other lower end ones, vacuums that are uh, canisters are preferred with bags. You probably could pick up one, a Eureka or, or one of those models for about $300. Um, the Dyson 
uh, is is reasonably good, but uh, the we don't typically like bagless vacuum cleaners because you're exposed when you're um, uh, emptying it. Uh, certainly, empty it outdoors, not in the house, but and, and wipe out the, the the canister and such. But um, those are, those are some of the issues. Yeah. Are there particular air filters that you find helpful and recommend to your clients? With air filters, um, I have tested with a laser particle counter on HEPAs, and they typically test pretty pretty good, whether it's a Honeywell from $250 or an IQ Air at uh, eight or $900 or $1,000. Um, I have never had a, a bad test result for mold with uh, either of those. Um, if there is a vacuum cleaner with carbon filter, like the Austin Air or uh, something of that sort, um, it's that can work better for gases, but mold and bacteria can also grow in carbon. So you don't want to use that in a basement or in a mold remediation uh, place. If someone is in a state where they can't see you, um, do you have a way for them to send samples to you that you can then evaluate under the microscope? How can you potentially support people that are in different parts of the country? Yes, I I did um, start a service quite a few years ago for people beyond uh, a distance and also for people uh, on a budget because a lot of individuals are just so uh, tapped out from medical expenses that to pay for a, a six or eight hour inspection and, and um, such is beyond the budget. So I have instructions for doing tape samples at home where I've tried to make it hypothesis based. Um, here's where you might test if you think this is an app, a, a problem or here's where I would test if I were in your home. And then they send me tape samples. Uh, the prices on those are fairly reasonable, 20 for for $100. And after you've hit $100, um, they're, they're $4 each. Uh, the, um, there are other prices, 3 for 25 or 8 for 50 And people send me tape samples. They take clear tape, uh, just um, Dollar General, Walmart, uh, any, any of those stores. Um, the one I've had a little difficulty with is Scotch Brand because unless there's a, a fair amount of debris on the tape, the glue can get uh, can separate from the cellophane and remain on the uh, the plastic bag that it, the tape is mounted on. So I lose the sample, and the people have to redo them. Um, but. Uh, other tapes typically work. They take like a three-inch piece of tape, hold it by the two ends, just press down on the middle section on the surface that they're testing. If it's if it's visible mold, they just have to touch a little area of the mold and then uh, turn under a quarter inch, put it on the outside of a plastic bag and send it to me first class mail. Uh, if they're testing something where they don't actually see mold, but they wonder if there's mold there, then I would recommend touching the same tape to 10 or 15 or even 20 spots just to broaden the, um, the investigation. And if there's mold on this tape, then that when we're not doing a research paper we're looking is there any mold and if there is is it a lot or is it a little because that'll help us to determine a course of action very good as we move into the last part of our discussion i want to touch on the topic of emfs so mm -hmm. i know that's something you look at as well why are electromagnetic radiation or electromagnetic fields so important why do you look for them and then from one of our prior discussions my understanding is that mold exposure historically caused different symptoms than it does since the introduction of emfs into our environment so can you tell us about that observation as well Yes, um, let's start with the latter then. Uh, I, I heard this from um, a retired physician who worked for 40 years with uh, people who were chemically and electrically sensitive mold and Lyme disease, that sort of um, uh, clientele. And she told me that she observed in the, in the early days, if people were exposed to mold, they'd have respiratory and allergic reactions. But she said she could track as people got cell phones and Wi-Fi in their homes that the symptoms seemed to go more towards the neurological, respiratory still, but also neurological. And I've heard that from another source that I, I don't remember at this point, but um, that's 
that's one uh, reflection that was of interest. Um, I uh, started with the electromagnetics um, a long time. Well, of course, I learned about it from the bowel biology. Um, so I've been doing this, these studies for close to 25 years. And I've gotten a lot of feedback from people that um, doing one thing or another to relieve exposure has been helpful to them. Um, I, I look at it a little differently, too. Um, there's so much dementia around and people having memory issues. To me, it just makes sense to protect your brain. You know, and to not have these exposures that are known to be biologically active. They may or may not be harmful, but one thing that we can be sure of, some of them have long-term effects, and it, and it can take a long time for the symptoms to be manifest. So that is um, where I'm coming from. Let's take zero as the safe number and get as close to it as possible. I was at a mold conference uh, up in um, upstate New York uh, years back and um, just happened to be standing next to a, a training supervisor from Canada Mortgage. And we were talking about the, the different speakers and such. And I, I referred mark to her. I said, you know, there are about a dozen studies that have showed, shown that exposure to electromagnetics of various sorts increases the permeability of the blood-brain barrier to the brain. And she, she um, remarked on that. And she said, you know, you'll never hear that at this conference. She said, it's not just mold, you know. And, and she's right. And she, she made a further interesting comment. She said, in America, you measure things. In Canada, we help people. <laughs> so where, you know, I try to keep that in mind that a screening inspection is not focused on measurements. It's focused on helping people. It's finding where the, where the um, sources are of exposure and what can be done practically to re reduce them. So when it comes to EMFs, talking about measuring, you measure five different types of electromagnetic fields, the AC magnetic fields, the low and high frequency radio frequency, the AC electric fields, and the DC electric fields. So tell us a little bit about each one of those, what are common sources, and what kinds of problems might those pose? Sure. Uh, the AC magnetic fields, their household current with the frequency of 60 hertz, which is the uh, unit designating frequency. These have been associated with uh, neurological disease, with cellular changes, with uh, learning difficulties, with cancer, um, uh, and, and across the board. These have been studied the most uh, relating with uh, childhood leukemia. So you can measure these with a simple Gauss meter, of course, my equipment is more expensive, but you could get yourself a Gauss Master on um, on the internet for thirty dollars or so, which is is adequate for a homeowner's needs. So you could get these exposures from power lines. You could get them from motors, from heat coils, like an electric stove, which we still recommend, but just find out which burners give off the lowest readings, usually the ones at the back and the smaller ones. Um, the, the AC magnetic fields are one, the one reading, if they're from the power lines, that you can't change once you've bought a house or rented a house. So it's a good idea to have a Gauss meter and screen for these magnetic fields from the power lines uh, before you um, make a commitment to a mortgage or or a, a rental. Uh, there are some stories that, um, one or two with each of these, that are quite dramatic. One house, because the power lines in the backyard were these big cross-country ones, um, the, the lowest reading I could get at the house, anywhere in the house, was nine millivolt, milli, sorry, milligauss, nine milligauss, and the so-called uh, conservative safe level is under one milligauss. So we're up to nine. And this woman said, I have breast cancer. I'm out of here. Um, so that's one example. 
another example is um, two houses I measured on Long Island in, in really upscale communities. Uh, they had an issue of current on the water pipes, and that's that's something that we check for on the houses. It's the way the houses are grounded sometimes uh, and from the National Electric Code. Anyway, the magnetic fields coming from these water pipes were close to 100 milligauss in the chairs where the husbands always sat. And unfortunately, I was there too late. Both men were deceased from blood cancers. Uh, so that's one area. We want to see them as close to zero as possible, but certainly under one for prolonged exposure. And then we go to the other type of field from household wiring, and that is um, AC electric fields, also called voltage, AC voltage. Voltage is a pressure where magnetic fields go through the house, go through the body. Voltage is attracted to the body as if we're antennas, which we are because we're mostly water. So we can measure the voltage at the bed and then do various things to reduce it. Let's say at an average bed, we're getting the, the person in the bed is getting exposure, getting voltage from the wires in the walls, from the overhead fan, from the, the clock or the uh, lamp next to the bed, and maybe from another area of the house, from a different, um, maybe a wiring area in another circuit or something of that sort. So we can measure that by using a simple a simple voltmeter, which is part of a multimeter, which you could buy in a um, in Home Depot, uh, just a simple multimeter, and then you would get wiring to connect up. Um, I have this on my website, how to do it, so I won't repeat it here, but you would go to createyourhealthyhome.com and check under the um, EMF tab and then body voltage, and it will walk you through how to do that. So let's say we got a reading of 2,000 millivolts at the bed, which is kind of an average reading for um, uh, outside of Manhattan anyway, um, where you get much lower readings because there they require metal clad wiring, which shields from voltage. We, we would all be better off with metal clad wiring in our homes, but it's more expensive, so we get the cheaper plastic type of wiring and and it doesn't shield for voltage so we would first unplug everything by the bed see if the reading goes down from 2000 maybe it goes down to let's say 1200 millivolts and then maybe they have a metal bed frame which is also an antenna so we would ground the metal bed frame by uh, dropping a line to the outside grounding it maybe it goes down to 800 at that point um nothing else we can do too easily so we might just try to find out which breaker which circuits um, are affecting the bedroom one person would be at the breaker box uh, I'd be up reading the meter and they would turn off all the circuits then one on at a time until we see which ones affect the bedroom and then they would have the option of either turning them off at night or having an electrician put them on a separate relay box uh, and then you could turn them off from up above by a, 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 a remote uh, and let's say we got down to maybe 200 millivolts just doing that. Uh, then the question of grounding comes up. Do we use a conductive cloth under the bed, um, under the um, sheet, the bottom sheet of the bed, and connect it to the outside or an earthing product um, or not? There are pros and cons on this. Um, one, yeah, and, and I tend to... Um, want to, I tend to try to give people the pros and cons and let them make their own decision because I have had some feedback that has been very good regarding um, grounding cloths and other people say you know didn't I didn't notice anything or it made me jittery. Uh, a couple of the things to watch out for. Uh, there is some instruction online that you could ground it to an electrical outlet don't believe that's a good idea. We do not recommend grounding it to an electrical outlet because you don't know what dirty electricity is even on the ground line of your house. Um, and what happens if there's a lightning strike or something? It's, it's not a good idea to have something uh, conductive so close to your body connected with your house electric system. So let's eliminate that from the start. You would want to ground it to the outside. That is not necessarily foolproof either because you, you always have some voltage in the outside earth. 
Is it a little bit? Is it a lot? So you want to measure that by measuring two spots in the earth and seeing what the voltage is between them. Um, I'm still learning about this field uh, from uh, Sal LaDuca, who has the um, EMR, emfrelief.com website. He just, just did me, just did a diagram for me to explain something about voltage in the earth. And I haven't had, I just got it last night and haven't had time to study it. So uh, I want to learn all the avenues of it. But um, the other day I was at a house and I was, another thing we do is measure the voltage between the house electrical system and the earth outside. So when I did that measurement, I usually get around 400 millivolts, which is would be typical. At this house, I got a, a lower reading, which was fine, but every once in a while, there'd be a sudden spike in the reading, like a, a low, 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 and then spike. Well, if that's in your earth, you certainly don't want to be grounded into that. And we don't know what's causing that spike at this point. I'm referring the people to a, 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 either a licensed electrician who has a, an idea, a, a facility with diagnostic work, or if that doesn't work, um, the uh, homeowner can call Sal Laduca, who could come either troubleshoot over the phone with the electrician or come out to the house and, and try to assess what's going on there. It is interesting with the grounding because I've seen, uh, when I explored this years ago myself, I've seen some cases where if the person was measuring their body voltage and then they touched the grounding sheet, their body voltage would actually go up, which is not a good thing, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, well, that's showing some some wiring issues somewhere. It may be a grounding issue if they're using the ground line for testing. No. Um, I haven't seen that personally, but I have seen odd things, and often it comes back to um, outlets or, or whatever. Um, there, there are two types of outlet testers even. There's a $5 version, which will give you the the indicator lights to, and you want to see whether the outlet is correctly wired or not. But if you go to the $10 version, which is available at the uh, lessemf.com website, uh, that will give you a silver button to press, and that tells you whether there is a true ground on that wire or not. If, if a warning triangle comes up in the window, you don't have a ground, even though this, the basic gauss me, the gauss, basic outlet tester said that it was properly, wi <clears throat> properly wired. So let's talk then about the DC electric fields. How does that come into play and what, what are the sources of those? DC electric fields would be static electricity. So, um, okay, so that's not a significant issue yeah. out of the ones we're looking at. And then the right. last two are the low and high radio frequency, which I'm assuming are the things that are coming from our computers and our cordless phones and all those things, right? Yeah. Well, they would both be high frequency. Uh, one is analog and one is digital. Analog is like smooth waves and digital is the smooth wave, but with pulses riding on them. So <clears throat> these pulses are very, very rapid, and they are the what transmits the information for the computer or the cell phone. These pulses are new to the human body. We're all guinea pigs in this. We have not been exposed to this before, and that's why it's a, such a concern. Uh, it's such a concern when the public is seeing these as uh, normal so and you mentioned convenient. You, you mentioned that both of those are high radio frequency. So what are some low radio frequency sources? Well, on the spectrum analyzer, you'd have other sources of radio frequency, such as um, ultraviolet light from the sun, you know, and microwave radiation and um, uh, radiation from um, fluorescent lights. I don't know if they'd be called particularly low. I mean, these are all high, high frequencies, okay. but different band bandwidth dim bandwidths yeah so one of the things that i know that you talk about relative to emfs is not having metal of, of any kind but even box springs for example in the bed and i'm assuming the reason for that is that that's making it kind of more of an antenna right so we want to have mattresses yeah. and and box springs that don't really have metal springs correct that's right that's right yeah okay. one other thing i'd like to mention too uh, back to the grounding issue um, a lot of people don't realize that as these grounding cloths are washed, they lose um, some of the metal fibers and they 
their effectiveness goes down. They don't necessarily last that long. That's why putting them under a top or bottom sheet so that you don't have to wash it so much is is preferable. Um, Another thing that I would strongly recommend is to monitor the connections. You might have a good reduction from the grounding sheet, and uh, yet over a winter, the the uh, the ground rod connection outside gets corroded, and all of a sudden you've lost your connection. And now, instead of reducing your voltage, you have raised it because you have another um, source of uh, of um, projection there. Um, the the uh, we just mentioned briefly the DC magnetic fields that could come from the inner springs um, because they get magnetized during con- during construction and um, they give off DC magnetic fields chaotically because they're coils they're not straight they're like magnets only uh, a coil form you can measure that on your bed by drawing uh, a compass across the top of the bed. You're seeing where the north is and then draw it slowly across the top and see how much deflection there is. Mm-hmm. One, um, one new bed had the, the, the uh, needle go all the way around 360 degrees and the woman said, you know, I don't know what's wrong with this bed, but I, I wake up in the middle of the night like I'm being jolted. So it was serving as an antenna for something. What in the indoor environment, you talked about fluorescent lights, what type of light bulbs are the healthiest based on your client work? Yeah. Uh, the feedback I've gotten from Sal LaDuca is what he recommends is um, low, lower energy use halogen bulbs. They look like the old incandescent, but they're halogen. And then not the halogen that was in those pole lamps that had uh, issues with the uh, fires. These are um, a different type of halogen light. So that's what we recommend. The others, um, even though you're not going to get the high radiation coming off LEDs as you would from fluorescent lights, anytime you have switching power supplies, which you do in both of those, um, you have dirty electricity being produced and just more electrical noise which along with not only the LEDs and the compact fluorescents, but dimmer switches are uh, producing um, just more irritation in the, in the wiring signals. Yeah. So the last question that I always wrap up with is, what are some of the key things that you do on a daily basis in support of your own health? Uh, um, well, my bedroom, I, I've, turn off the breakers, so I'm sleeping much more quietly. Um, And I have um, plenty of fresh air. I like the open windows, but I have good outside air too where I live. Uh, I I have switched from wireless to hardwired um, uh, installation at my computer, so I don't have exposure to any wireless in my home. Um, I have instructions for how to do that. If anyone would like to email me, I can send you those instructions. And um, I also have a landline phone. So again, I'm not using my cell phone. My cell phone is really turned off in the house, and I'm just using it when I'm traveling for emergency use. So my exposure to electromagnetic fields is really pretty low. And um, I was lucky enough to move into a, a 55 plus community not too long ago and it was it's owned and run by Men- Mennonites and it will never be a high tech community I'll never have much exposure there and it's a, a real good base of operation for me um, from a health standpoint yeah, yeah that's amazing <laughs> awesome well this has been super super fun I certainly appreciate you taking time to talk with us today this topic of mold and environmental illness is such a big topic. I think we're only just hitting the tip of the iceberg in terms of really understanding the health implications of the environment that we've created around us. And so I appreciate people like you that are out there doing great work to try and help people to optimize their environment, thus optimizing their health. And so thank you so, so much today for being here and for everything that you do. And I've enjoyed being with you. Thank you, Scott, for your work. All right. Thanks so much, me. Bye-bye. To learn more about today's guest, visit createyourhealthyhome.com or moldcontrolonabudget.com. 
That's createyourhealthyhome.com or moldcontrolonabudget.com. Thanks for your interest in today's show. If you'd like to follow me on Facebook or Twitter, you can find me there as Better Health Guy. To support the show, please visit betterhealthguy.com forward slash donate. If you'd like to be added to my newsletter, visit betterhealthguy.com forward slash newsletters. And this and other shows can be found on YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and Spotify. The content of this show is for informational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose, treat, or cure any illness or medical condition. Nothing in today's discussion is meant to serve as medical advice or as information to facilitate self-treatment. As always, please discuss any potential health-related decisions with your own personal medical authority.